Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. All right, sorry about that. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so you should be able to uh, see a presentation now. Yeah, it looks good. All right, great. Um, so thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm Julian Paganini. I work at, uh, as a PhD candidate at the UMC Utrecht at the medical microbiology department. And I'll be showing an optimized short read approach to predict and reconstruct uh, ARC plasmids from E. coli. So probably everybody here knows that the antibiotic resistance is kind of a big deal. Um, how much of a big deal? Well, in the European Union alone, there's uh, each year 700,000 infections caused by resistant bacteria, which leads to approximately 40,000 deaths. Uh, what I didn't know when I started my PhD is that 50% of these infections are caused by E. coli and that 30% uh, of the deaths are also caused by these bacteria. Um, obviously, the spread and emergence of antibiotic resistance is a big deal, but uh, we can probably say with a high degree of confidence that uh, plasmids are one of the main drivers behind this spread. And that's because these uh, genomic elements frequently contain uh, genes that provide resistance to antibiotics. And um, because they can be horizontally transferred among bacteria by diverse mechanisms. Um, plasmids can be transferred among bacteria of the same species, but sometimes they can be transferred among bacteria of different species and sometimes uh, among bacteria of different genera as well. Um, so basically, this means that we need to identify and track plasmids, and um, the question is, how do we do that, and what are the challenges that we face to do that? Um, so if you and your lab have money, uh, the challenge is smaller, because what you can do, actually, is you can sequence your uh, bacterial genome using Illumina short reads and also um, nanopore long reads, and uh, you can do a hybrid assembly and after uh, that hybrid assembly, most of the times you will obtain a nice and uh, uh, yeah, a very nice complete genome in which uh, the plasmid sequences are very precisely identified. The problem with this is that the long read sequencing at the moment is very expensive and it's very expensive in Europe. Uh, so you can imagine that other parts of the world, it's even more inaccessible to do. The cheaper alternative for this is uh, just doing short read sequencing with Illumina technology. And in this kind of technology, what we do is we extract the DNA, then we fragment the DNA into little pieces. And um, then using an assembly, we try to stitch together these uh, small fragments of DNA. And we don't obtain a complete genome, but what we obtain is longer stretches of DNA, that are DNA sequence that are called contexts. Um, the problem here is that we lose information. So uh, these contexts, we don't know if they derive from the chromosome, if they derive from one plasmid, or if they derive uh, from multiple plasmids. Um, likely, there's a lot of bioinformatic tools uh, that help in uh, predicting plasmids from short reads. And we can uh, kind of basically categorize the tools into two main groups. The first group will be uh, binary classification tools um, and there's a few examples over here. And these tools, what they will try to do basically is kind of sort the context out into either plasmid-derived context or chromosome-derived context. So then you kind of obtain a plasmidome of a bacterial genome. Uh, there's another kind of tools that are called plasmid reconstruction tools. Uh, another few examples over here. And uh, basically these tools takes this process a bit further and they will try to put this context together into individual plasmid predictions. Um, so last year, what we did was uh, basically compare how these plasmid reconstruction tools uh, work in particular for E. coli. Um, so what we did, kind of when I show you a bit of the method is we went to NCBI public database and we downloaded 240 complete E. coli genomes. Um, we know that these were complete because they were assembled by this uh, fancy method, hybrid assembly, using both short and, uh, short and long reads. And we also downloaded the corresponding short reads to these isolates. Um, what we did is grabbing the short reads, uh, we assembled the context, and then we provide these context and sometimes these reads uh, as an input for six different plasmid reconstruction tools. So for each of the plasmid reconstruction tools, we obtain a set of, of plasmid predictions that I'm also sometimes gonna call beans. 
And then uh, we compare these beans back to the original plasmids to see how the tools perform at, at performing this task. Um, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna have to show you a few metrics that we use and what they mean uh, for analyzing uh, how good the predictions were. Um, so one of the metrics that we use, uh, it's called recall. And um, basically recall allow us to answer the following question. What fraction of the true plasmid is represented by uh, the plasmid prediction? Um, so after doing sequence alignment of the prediction against the true plasmid, uh, we could say if half of the true plasmids is there, then recall is 0 0.5, for instance. Another metric that we used was precision. And precision allows to answer the following question. Is the prediction composed by context derived from a unique plasmid or from context derived from multiple plasmids? Uh, so in this case, for instance, if we have a prediction of a here, um, and uh, let's say AKB derived from plasmid one, and then 2KB derived from the chromosome. So in this case, we can assign a precision of 0.8. Uh, and then we use the F1 score, which is basically the harmonic mean between precision and recall. So this means that if you get a high F1 score, uh, the prediction is good. It's, it's very close to the true plasmid. But if you have a low F1 score, that, that means that it's not that good. Um, so how did these six different tools perform at reconstructing the E. coli plasmids? Well, first, I'm going to show you the F1 score here on the y-axis. And on different colors, you have uh, the different tools. And what you see here is plasmids that uh, don't contain antibiotic resistance genes. So there's a few tools that perform very well for this type of plasmids. Uh, in particular, we see here mob suit plasmid spades and fishing for plasmid being uh, the best performers. Um, however, uh, this kind of landscape changes um, when uh, we use plasmids that do contain antibiotic resistance genes. So here on the right, um, we have the same tools, but in this case for plasmids that contain antibiotic resistance genes. And what we can see is uh, kind of a big drop in the F1 score values uh, for all the tools. Uh, so that means that basically all tools show difficulties for reconstructing uh, ARC plasmids. Um, also, we analyze, apart from the recall precision and F1 score, uh, the capacity of the tools for detecting the antibiotic resistance genes. Uh, and what we can see here basically is the number of antibiotic resistant genes that each of the tools detected. And on the, on the far left, we basically see a true plasmid derived uh, detected um, antibiotic resistant genes. In the middle, we see the, the genes that were missed by the tools. And here on the, on the right of each box, uh, we see chromosomal contamination. So these are basically the number of uh, chromosomal uh, antibiotic resistant genes that were included in the plasma predictions. Um, and what we can see here is that basically most of the tools missed to identify an important fraction of plasmid derived uh, antibiotic resistance genes. So as a conclusion from, from this study in general, as an overall conclusion, we say, okay, MOPSUIT was probably the best performing tool uh, for reconstructing plasmids uh, on, on E. coli. Uh, because it missed very few antibiotic resistant genes, just 10%, and then it presented a decent F1 score. However, we thought that we could kind of uh, improve the performance of this tool. And um, oh, by the way, if you want a much more detailed comparison uh, of these tools, you can find it on, on this article over here. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to get into all the details on, that we did here, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very nice article to check if you're interested in reconstructing E. coli plasmids. So, by the way, we thought we, um, uh, we could improve the reconstruction of these plasmids in E. coli. Um, and the way we did that was basically combining two tools that were uh, developed at the UMC Utrecht. One of these tools is uh, Plasmid EC, which was developed by uh, Lisa Bader, uh, which was a master's student that was working uh, last year. And uh, we also use uh, G+, uh, which was originally developed by uh, Sergio Arredondo Alonso. Um, and to understand what we did exactly, we need to understand how G plus works first. One important thing to note about G plus is that it takes as an input an assembly graph. Um, so basically, I explained before that after doing assembly, you get a set of contexts um, that are longer fragments of DNA sequence. Uh, but we also get something else, which is how these contexts are potentially connected to each other 
and this is called the assembly graph. Um, so this is a naive representation of the assembly graph. In reality, usually assembly graphs are, are a bit more complicated. Um, and so let's suppose we give this assembly graph as an input for G plus. Um, the first step that G plus will do is we'll try to identify uh, the plasmid derived context from this assembly graph that are here in green using uh, one of two tools, either MR plasmids or PlasFlow, depending on the species that you select. And then what it will do, it will try to, uh, it will generate a series of plasmid walks in which uh, the plasmid derived contexts are basically uh, trying to be connected to each other um, based on the similarity of the read coverage. And the tool will do this many times and it will do a starting from each of the different plasmid predicted uh, contexts, basically. And based on how frequently two contexts are found on the same walk, uh, it will generate a plasmid on network, and then it will partition that network using different um, uh, partitioning algorithms, and it will generate a series of bin of on, on plasmid predictions, as I explained before. Um, so how did we improve this process? Well, um, we kind of had the impression that this initial first step in which we identified the plasmid derived context was not working very good for E. coli. Um, so we kind of replaced this and now you can provide um, basically the input from any tool to G+. You're not limited only to ML plasmid or, or PlasFlow. Particularly for E. coli, uh, we replace it uh, with uh, plasmid ensemble classifier, or here I'm going to show some of the results that we obtain by replacing it by uh, a plasmid ensemble classifier or plasmid EC. Um, so plasmid EC, I still didn't explain what it is. It's basically classified context into plasmid or chromosome derived context, and it does that by combining the results of three different classification tools and implementing a majority voting system. At the moment, there's four tools available that you could combine in, in every way you want. Um, and the way it works is, is pretty simple. It will grab each of the contexts and it will make predictions with each of the tools. And if, for instance, two of the tools uh, says that this context one is plasmid, um, then it will call it a plasmid as an output and it will provide also a probability of this context being a plasmid. Um, in the case that two of the tools say it's a chromosome, then of course the, the tool will call it a chromosome. Um, so I'm going to show you some results of these. First of all, I want to show you how the plasmid EC uh, works for uh, the binary classification of context derived from ARC plasmids. And for this, we use a data set that included 148 uh, complete ARC plasmids. And what you can see here on the y-axis are the different individual tools that we combine and also the different tools combinations. Um, so and obviously on the x-axis, there's the fraction of plasmid contexts that were correctly identified by um, the tools. And what we find here is that this particular combination of tools, platform, plasmid, and RF plasmid outperforms all other combinations and all other um, individual classifier, which means that plasmid EC um, correctly identified the highest number of contexts derived from uh, our plasmids. Um, so now we compare um, the combination of plasmid EC and G plus uh, against uh, MOPSUIT, which was the best performing tool in our previous study, using the same data set. So we will retain the comparability between the studies. And just to test, we also um, combine G plus uh, with the output from PLASCO. Um, just in the previous slide, PLASCO was the best individual. Uh, classifier basically, that's why we choose it. Um, and what we find here um, when, when reconstructing E. coli plasmids again, um, was basically that for, on the bottom you see that um, plasmids that don't contain antibiotic resistance genes, there's not, not a big difference over there, uh, but for plasmids that do contain antibiotic resistance genes, the F1 score was, uh, much higher for both methods that included uh, that including G plus, um, and this is kind of a very obvious conclusion. Um, and 
Uh, the F1 score is basically the harmonic mean, if you recall, from precision and recall. So we wanted to know if it was either precision or recall that was actually, um, let's say, uh, driving this difference. And what we found was that uh, precision values were very similar uh, between Mopsuit and the two version of G+. Uh, but the main difference uh, was basically on recall. Um, so if you re if you remember, recall was basically uh, the fraction of true plasmids that is represented by uh, by the prediction. Um, so basically, this allows us to conclude um, two things: is that both version of G plus outperform mobs at reconstructing plasmids that contain unfair resistance genes, and that in general the G plus methods are better at binding a uh, context together into the same prediction. That's why we have a basically a higher recall. Um, we also evaluated how the tools perform at uh, detecting antibiotic resistance genes. And um, in this case, we have again the number of antibiotic resistance genes on the y axis. And we have um, the genes that were detected in orange, they're not detected in light gray, and the chromosomal genes in, in dark gray. And what we can see here is that um, basically the G method detected the same amount of uh, antibiotic resistance genes at Mopsuit. Um, and uh, the only difference here as well is that probably the G plus methods include a bit more chromosomal contamination in, in the predictions. Uh, so as a general conclusions from this study, um, we basically can say that our plasmids are, are difficult to reconstruct from short with data. Um, we can also say that integrating the ensemble classifier with G plus provides uh, best results for reconstructing our plasma in E. coli. And um, probably the last conclusion is that combining long and short reads is still the best option to reconstruct plasma, but it's, uh, it's a bit expensive. So if you only have short reads um, and you're working with E. coli, um, probably you would, uh, I would definitely choose plasma DC and G plus to, to reconstruct the plasmids. Uh, finally, I would like to thank to uh, my supervisor, Anita Schurch, Ninka Plantin and Rob Billens, and also to uh, Lisa Vader and, and Sergio Arredondo for, for this work. And I also would like to thank to the entire uh, bioinformatics department. Uh, they are really very, very nice people, and uh, they, they really have helped me a lot in, uh, in this work. Um, I don't know if there's any questions. Apologies, I was muted. Um... Great. That's thanks very much. That was super interesting. Um, this is a chance for anyone to ask any questions. And if not, or if you have not having a chance to type it in fast enough, uh, we could save the questions for the discussion session at the end. Nothing going, going, gone. Okay. Uh, thank you, Julian, for that talk. That was super. And um, I hope we'll hear from you again in the discussion.